What's up guys, welcome to Heresy Financial. This is the channel where we talk about financial topics in a way that is considered heresy uh, to the financial establishment. Today we're gonna be discussing inflation. Uh, back in the 1980s, there was a change made to the CPI, which is the measurement, the indicator that the Fed uses in order to gauge how much inflation there is and what monetary policy they should take in reaction to the current amount of inflation. So what we're gonna be looking at today is that measurement, how it's changed, how that has affected the average American and what you can do to profit off the coming changes to inflation. Let's dive in. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Like I said, we're gonna be diving into inflation, the changes made to the CPI in the 1980s, how that affects you and what you can do about it to profit off of it in the coming years. But before we dive in, a little bit of a story time here. Uh, on Thanksgiving, I was playing Monopoly with my siblings. Now, this Monopoly board game that we have was actually my father's when he was growing up. So this is a really, really old uh, board and the pieces, they're all the, you know made out of actual metal. They're probably lead. To be honest, we probably have lead poisoning now. But apparently, the game of Monopoly was a little bit too boring for my father and his siblings when he was growing up. And so what they did was they changed the rules of the game. So on some of the chance and community chest cards, they've written in their own rules. So sometimes when it says, hey, you get $45, it actually says you get $450. Uh, one of the other rules that they changed was that you never pay the bank for anything. All payments go to the center pot. So every time you buy a property, every time you pay taxes, or anything that doesn't go to another player goes to the center of the pot. And then when you land on the free parking spot, you collect all the money that is gathered up at the middle of the board in the pot. So at first glance, especially as kids, this looks like a very fun way to play Monopoly because you're just waiting to land on the free parking spot because then you can get loaded up with cash again. Now I haven't played this game for years, but as I was playing this time, it struck me how close this was to the reality of how inflation affects us today. Because as the game was going on, you had certain players that were getting loaded up with thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in Monopoly. So when you had exchanges or purchases of properties from one player to another, you weren't buying them at the normal board price or even a little bit above that. You had properties like Mediterranean Avenue, which I think is the cheapest property on the entire board, going for three or four thousand dollars. You had some players that were loaded up with houses and hotels on their monopolies and other players who were just getting crushed because yes, they might have had one property here, one property there, but the rent on a normal property is stuck at the amount that the card says. It doesn't actually get improved by the inflation that's happening in the board game. And so you might collect a dollar or $6 or $15 for rent if somebody lands on your property. While in order to pick up another property, it might cost you thousands of dollars. And so it's fascinating to see inflation play out in a board game because asset prices skyrocketed, wages, which would be like the rents from the properties without the houses or the hotels, were stagnant, and you had a massive wealth gap that kept on increasing because some players who were able to kind of get over that hump, maybe they scored that free parking pot early on in the game and they were able to load up on some properties with houses or hotels. The game got easier and easier for them as they went on and they were able to take and scoop up more and more of all that extra money while some of the players, it just crushed them faster and faster. It also changed how the game was played because instead of playing the game like normal, accumulating properties, maybe a mortgage here and there, you were playing in order to land on that free parking spot because really that was the only way that you could get ahead. Now, Monopoly was not designed to be played like this, obviously. It wasn't actually fun. Eventually, most of the players who weren't able to get ahead or were getting crushed, the game went on too long and they just quit. And so it wasn't actually a fun way to play the game and it wasn't the way the game was designed. Similarly, that's not the way the game of money and life was originally supposed to be, and it's not the way America played all along, uh, even until the 1980s. So as we all know, as soon as Nixon closed the gold window and we went off the gold standard in 1971, there was rampant inflation because money was no longer tied to any hard commodity or physical asset. So the US government could print as much money as they wanted with no consequences. Well, the Federal Reserve wanted to do something to get in front of this. So Paul Volcker, he raised the interest rates a ton to try and curb inflation. But what a lot of people don't know is that the CPI, which is the main measurement of inflation, it's a consumer prices index, was actually changed in 1980. 
And coincidentally, that was the same year that inflation got under control. It was almost a magical fix. And I say magical because it really was. There wasn't an actual change to the amount of inflation. There was just a way they changed the measurement of it. It's like if you're building a house and it, the house isn't big enough for what the builder originally intended. So instead of just fixing the house and making it bigger, they change the size of their inches on their measuring tapes. So that, yeah, the, the house is supposed to be 10 feet, it's measuring at nine feet, let's change the size of the inches. Now we can say it's 10 feet because we changed the size of the measuring tape. Nothing in reality changed, but the people who don't know that the rules of the game changed are gonna be hurt, they're gonna be screwed over. And so that's exactly what happened in 1980. They started making changes to the way that inflation was measured. They changed the rules of the game. One of the reasons why they wanted wanted to change the CPI to inaccurately reflect inflation instead of reporting it accurately was because they knew it was too expensive if everybody knew that inflation was really high. Because when inflation is high, interest rates have to be high. And if interest rates are high, it's harder for the government to borrow money. And it's also harder to keep up with expenses like Social Security and Medicare. And so if you can trick everybody into thinking, hey, inflation's not actually as high as it is, well, I don't have to pay more and more each year for Social Security. I don't have to pay more and more for Medicare expenses. And I also don't have to pay a higher interest rate on the debt that I'm using to spend my money. I, I can borrow at a cheaper interest rate because uh, the lenders are not expecting their money to be worth less when they get it back. And so they're not demanding as high of an interest rate. So the government, the Federal Reserve, they have a vested interest in having inflation uh, not be reported accurately. One of the ways that they changed the CPI was with the substitution method. So this substitution method said, hey, if steak gets too expensive, consumers are gonna substitute steak with something like ground beef. And so if, if something like that happens, if there's one item that has you know, a runaway increase in prices, well, we're gonna change the CPI to then more, more heavily weight that whatever it would be substituted with like ground beef. Well, the problem with this is before this change was made, the CPI measured standard of living. After this change was put in place, the CPI now measures the standard of survival. Because before that substitution method was put in place, you were able to accurately see how much more money you needed to make each year in order to keep up your standard of living. If I'm buying steak every year, I want to know how much my life expenses are increasing by to maintain my standard of living to buy steak each year. That's an accurate representation of how much more expensive life is getting. If I have to substitute out that steak for something of lower quality like ground beef, you can't accurately say that that's a measure of the cost of increase in standard of living. That's just a measure of survival instead. So they change it from an arithmetic weighting to a geometric weighting. And so it automatically weights more heavy the items that are falling in price and it weights less the items that are rising in price. And so they built in this uh, genius tool for tricking everybody into thinking that inflation is not as high as it is because they discount more and more anything that's getting expensive. Another way that they changed it was how they measured the price of electronics and technology. They started measuring units of processing power, basically. And so uh, every year you get another iPhone or another Android or another computer or maybe, maybe every couple of years, and uh, it has a lot more processing power, computing power than it did the previous year or the previous generation. And so they're measuring increases in technology, the price is based off of the uh, increase in computing power. The problem is your iPhone might be double the speed as it was two years ago, but it's not half the price. It's the same price. They're basically saying there's a decrease in price in electronics and technology and computers, and, and there really isn't because there's a decrease in the cost per computing power, but in each device, there's just more of it, and the devices are actually getting more expensive. Another way that they manipulate the CPI, and they've made these changes, they, they started making them in the 1980s, and they've made them through the 90s, and even until now, they continue tweaking it. But one of the other changes that they put in was the hedonics. And so if you get a new washing machine that costs 20% more, but you go from a washing machine that had a physical dial to one that has buttons, well, you're paying for an increase in the pleasure or the quality. Doesn't matter that none of them have the manual dials anymore and they all have buttons. And so while there is an actual increase in cost of average utilities or expenses or appliances or whatever category you're looking at, they're deflating that. They're taking some of that pricing out because they say, well, it's an increase in quality. 
And that's true, but it still doesn't accurately reflect the average price increases that are actually taking place. And now more and more than ever, they're looking at core CPI instead of just the full CPI, which is ludicrous because the core CPI excludes things like food, it excludes energy, there's no housing taken into account, there's no healthcare, there's no tuition. The biggest expenses that most Americans have Probably the only expenses for a lot of Americans are not included. So it has nothing to do with the average cost of living for the vast majority of Americans. Now here's why this is important. The Federal Reserve recently announced that they're taking a much more aggressive approach at trying to hit higher inflation numbers. They're saying that they need to make up for lost inflation because they can't hit their 2% symmetrical mark. Now, if you look at the way that inflation was measured in the 1980s and you apply that to today, inflation is probably closer to 5%, maybe even all the way up to 10%. And the problem is they're not just being naive and stupid. They actually know what they're doing. Daniel DiMartino Booth used to work for the Federal Reserve and she tweeted a couple of days ago saying, Hence the fallacy of anyone, especially Fed officials, being so naive as to buy into an inflation metric they formally acknowledged inside the Fed when I was there throughout the crisis that it was broken. The hypocrisy is infuriating. So they know that the inflation metrics they use are not accurate and they don't work. They've formally acknowledged it inside the Fed, but they still use it. The primary reason is so that they can print more money, monetize more debt, and actually cause more and more real inflation without having to report it or say that it's actually happening. Now take a look at this chart. This is a chart that shows consumer inflation from uh, 19, uh, this is 1990 base, but it's from the year 2000, it looks like. And so this is the, the red and the yellow uh, lines there. Those are the official CPU, or I'm sorry, this official CPI numbers. The blue is, uh, um, measured off of the shadow stats, which is looking more at the 1990 based inflation numbers. So you can see this shows that if it's if we measured it closer to how we measured it in 1990s, our inflation numbers would be uh, hitting around that 5%, a little over 5% right now, not under 2% like they're saying. Um, now take a look at this one even worse. If we measure it from the 1980 numbers uh, through today, it looks like it's closer to 10% than that 2% number. Um, and so you can clearly see here that there have been massive changes because if they were measured the same way, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, BLS.org, you can go see they've very, uh, they've documented all the changes that they've made along the way. So this is, this is accurate. Uh, you can go back and do testing on these numbers to see what they would be today if they use the same numbers here. So what would, uh, what, what are some of these areas that are excluded? What are some of these areas that are not being measured today? And do they really matter? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the first one, which there's $1.4 trillion worth of student debt right now. Let's take a look at how much uh, tuition costs have risen recently. Oh, would you look at that? Since 2000, uh, the average uh, price of private universities has risen from, what is that, about $16,000 all the way to over $40,000. And uh, out-of-state and in-state have had significant increases as well in their pricing. So from this, we can see that's very clear why it's not included in the inflation numbers because uh, then inflation would be a lot higher officially than it is right now because the cost of living for a vast, a huge chunk of Americans, college students, has been rising exponentially. Let's look at another area that is excluded from uh, the inflation numbers, healthcare expenditures. Now this chart goes through 2010 here, and we'll look at the last 10 years in a moment, goes from, the, from 2000 to 2010. You can see during that time, the cost of private health insurance has risen 134%, and that's just the health insurance. Out-of-pocket expenses have gone up 50% almost. Medicare and Medicaid expenses have gone up astronomically. Uh, there have been insane expense increases in healthcare, and that's just from 2000 to 2010. Now let's take a look at the last, uh, let's see, this is about seven years here, from 2003 to uh, uh, the beginning here of 2020, end of 2019. Again, astronomical increases in the price of healthcare here. So if you look at the last chart, went through 2010, so let's look here at that 2011 bar. The uh, employer premium contribution was $12,000 uh, back in 2011. Now it is $15,000 as of 2018. So that's money coming out of your pocket as an employee. That's money your employer has to pay 
to the health insurance company that they can't pay you because healthcare costs are increasing. And if they provide benefits, this is the employer contribution to the healthcare spending. And so this is money that you are losing out on. And if your wages have not even increased by you know those $3,000, $4,000 over the last couple of years, you've lost money because this is money coming out of your pocket. This is money they can't pay to your paycheck. This is money they're paying to the uh, health insurance companies. And then similarly, the family premium contribution and the family out-of-pocket spending have also increased. Again, from 2011 numbers, that's about $5,000 for family premium contribution plus out-of-pocket spending, up to seven, almost $8,000 today. Uh, so that's a huge increase in then what's coming out of your pocket. So yeah, you might be getting a tiny little raise for cost of living expenses based off of inflation numbers that are saying it's less than 2%, but your, just your healthcare costs are way more than that, increasing every single year. So your paychecks have actually been getting smaller every single year, even though you've been getting a cost of living increase in your paychecks because your healthcare expenses have gone up so much because the Federal Reserve says healthcare doesn't count and healthcare doesn't uh, get included in inflation numbers, so it's not included in the cost of living increases. Brilliant. Let's look at the next thing that is included from the, uh, the next thing that's excluded from inflation numbers, which is housing. Uh, now this chart goes back to 1980 here just about, so you can see the median price of homes has gone up and up and up and up and up in terms of the US dollar here. And uh, obviously that's, you know, why, how, they couldn't include that in inflation numbers because then they would show inflation is really high because uh, cost of uh, housing has gone up. Now, just so you know, this applies to renters too, because if the price to buy a property goes up, the price to rent goes up. If I bought an investment property, let's say 10 years ago to rent it out, and I'm buying another one this year, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. I can't rent it out for the same price that I was renting out my one from 10 years ago. My mortgage is a lot more, my expenses are a lot more. And so housing prices going up also impacts rents. Now, a lot of people are saying, hey, if there's so much inflation right now, if the Federal Reserve is printing so much money, all this quantitative easing, the debt monetization, all the repo operations, where's all this money going? How about the stock market? I showed in one of my last videos how the money that's coming from the Federal Reserve right now is almost all directly going into the stock market right now over the past year or two years. It's basically the easy debt is causing a lot of corporate loans to be taken out and the vast majority of the corporate loans are being used for stock buybacks and the vast majority of the increase in the stock market over the last couple of years has been directly due to the stock buybacks from corporations and so this money printing, this debt monetization, all this easy free money coming into the system is basically almost all of it just going straight into the stock market and inflating asset prices directly in the stock market. And so, uh, yep, that's what it looks like. We've had a massive increase in the price of the stock market. And by the way, I showed in my last video too, the uh, corporate profits have not been keeping up. They've actually been going down. And so the fundamentals are not supporting this increase in the prices of stocks. The price to earnings ratio are at the uh, highest they've been in a very long time. Now I wanna pause here because it's very important to remind anyone, especially somebody who's new to the channel, inflation purely reflects the value of your dollar going away. It doesn't mean there's more wealth in the system. It doesn't mean things have increased in value. It doesn't mean things have gotten more expensive per se. All it means is that your dollar has lost its purchasing power, so it takes more of your dollars to buy the same thing. It is vitally important for anybody who wants to get ahead financially to understand this fact because the natural state of the world is deflation. Technology increases, production increases, population increases. Everything that humanity does automatically, naturally by itself, makes deflation a natural byproduct of progress. Life gets cheaper over time. And this was always the natural way of things until the Federal Reserve came in and started inflating the money supply in 1913 and things really got out of hand uh, during the Bretton Woods Agreement globally and then especially it just was the kind of the final nail in the coffin on letting inflation run loose in 1971 when Nixon closed the gold window. But deflation is the natural state of the world. That means that life gets cheaper. That means if your wages don't change, Next year, you can afford more things than you can last year. And the year after that, you can afford more. And that means if you put $100 in your savings account, that means next year it's gonna be worth more than it is this year. 
you have a natural increase in the amount of money and wealth that you have because, hey, they figured out a better and faster and cheaper way to make bread this year. So bread got cheaper, your money goes farther. These are fundamental laws of money and you cannot break the fundamental laws of money. You can run away from them, you can try, try and change them, you can manipulate them for a while, eventually they snap back, but they are fundamental laws of money and it's how money naturally works. And so to prove my point, I'm gonna show you something here that shows that these laws still apply. The difference between now and pre-1913 was that the dollar and gold were the same thing. They meant the same thing, they operated in the same way. But as soon as there was a split, a divergence from paper money and physical gold or physical money, people kept on playing by the rules of gold, but they were using paper money, so people started to get screwed. But not the rich. That's the point. The rich understand how these things work. The rich buy assets and the rich are not impacted by inflation because they know how the game works. So just to prove my point that these are fundamental laws of money, let's look at things priced in gold. First here, take a look at the price of gold. So this chart here is the price of gold since 1970. You can see that it goes up and that's simply a reflection of how much value the dollar has lost because the value of gold has barely changed. It doesn't really change, it's extremely stable. So it only goes up in terms of dollars because it takes more of your dollars to buy gold today than it used to because the purchasing power of the dollar has gone away. Just like in Venezuela, it takes a lot more Venezuelan dollars to buy a loaf of bread than it used to because the purchasing power of the Venezuelan dollars have gone away. So let's look at a couple things that are priced in gold to show how the natural state of the world still exists. You just have to play by the right rules and you can still get ahead even though everybody else is playing by the wrong rules. This is a fun one. Let's take a look at Big Macs. Big Macs priced in gold. Well, isn't that interesting? The price of Big Macs have trended down. Now look at this one, coffee. Well, look at that. Now this one is a very, very interesting one because coffee is, uh, apart from the volatility that it had there in the 90s, coffee has been an extremely stable um, crop. And you can see this, that it, very has, it has very low volatility in terms of its uh, price measured in gold. But the price still goes down when measured in gold. There have been a couple advancements in the harvesting or the planting or the yields or whatever it might be, the processing maybe, but it has gotten a little bit cheaper in terms of gold. Now look at this, the food index measured in gold. It has trended down. Life has been getting cheaper in terms of gold. Now take a look at this chart. This is the S&P 500 measured in gold. And so uh, this is the opposite. You can see that it's gotten expensive and there's a reversion to that kind of that floor on where the, the stock market goes to in, term, in times of crashes, recessions, uh, collapses, and then it gets more and more expensive. And we're seeing a period of time right now where the S&P 500, the stock market is very expensive when measured in gold. It's also very expensive measured in dollars, but it's also in gold there. And then lastly here, this is the price of housing measured in uh, the blue line is US dollars. Uh, the orange line is measured in gold. So if you're playing by the rules of gold, it gets cheaper. So obviously you can't play by the rules pre-1913. You can't actually use gold for transactions. There are a couple companies that are trying to make that happen, but uh, obviously regulators and governments, central banks don't want that to be able to happen and so they're doing everything they can to shut that down. So the important thing to look at here is to make sure that you're using gold as a savings account instead of cash. If you hold cash as your savings account, US dollars, any fiat currency, the purchasing power will decrease and as the purchasing power decreases, that makes asset prices run away. Even prices of goods and services are eventually going to skyrocket from this. Treat gold like your savings account. It's real money. It still operates that way. We've seen that life gets cheaper in terms of gold still so use that as a savings account store that up and then it's soon enough you'll have enough to use that for an investment whether it's for a, a rental home or a personal residence or stock market purchase or whatever it is that you're looking at use that to build up your nest egg, your chunk of money to use for a larger purchase don't store up US dollars or fiat currencies because everything is moving away from you faster than you're being able to save that up this problem is only going to increase because as we've seen the Fed is trying to change the rules of the game again and they're going after inflation more and more aggressively because they need inflation to be a lot higher and they again cannot have anybody know about it so 
They're trying to trick everybody to play by the rules of the game that actually ruin you. But if you play by the real rules of the game, how the fundamental laws of money have always worked and still work, you'll join the ranks of those who are helped and get richer from inflation instead of those who are impoverished. Tell as many people as you can. The more people that know about this, the better off our society will be. Share this video with somebody. Hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already so that more people can see this. I really appreciate you guys watching. You guys have a great day. Thank you.